Lindell. Okay. So <clears throat> here's what I've discovered through the years. And it goes like this. Most Christians don't have a clue what happened to them when they got born again. Most Christians don't have a clue to the power that resides in them because they don't know how to not yield their members, as Romans 6 talks about, and how to let the Holy Spirit reign in their life. And we're going to talk about that, and we will debunk stuff as we go through just by reading the book of Romans. And the history of Romans is this. Every great revival, every great transformation, every great pastor, evangelist will always tell you that Romans is what changed their life and gave them power to live. Well, what we do is we will, I will read off scriptures and people will grab that scripture and look it up and read it. Okay. That way it goes a little faster and people are, are participating in there. Gotcha. So, uh, Wendy, why don't you jump ahead and take 2 Peter 1, 2 through 4. 2 Pete 1, 2, 3, and 4. And then, Lindell, you got Matthew 3, 15 through 17. Okay, I'm going to have to readjust some things here. Okay. I'm going to stand. So we're going to talk about who was Paul and how did he arrive on the scene. But first, we're going to talk about what the Bible promises us in 2 Peter. Okay. 2 Peter. Let's Peter, where are you? Ah, Peter. Okay. I got so many bookmarks in here. Second Peter one. Two through four. Yep. Two through four. And I have it underlined. Grace uh, and peace be am I supposed to read? Yep. Okay. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped in corruption that is in the world through lust. Okay. A couple of points here. In verse 3, it talks about his divine power because we have the knowledge of God. So that divine power, that divine dunamis power is ours that pertain to life. So there's a power that comes into life, into our life through knowledge because he, him, capital H, Jesus, called us. And he's given to us, in verse 4, exceedingly great and precious promises. So we can be partakers of the divine nature. And this is what is so great about being born again. We get to partake of the divine nature. And what we're going to discover in the book of Romans is how does that divine nature, how does that power work in us? And then how do we escape the corruption in the world by lust? So there's a way to escape all of the bummers in life and the corruption. And there's power given to us to overcome all things. We just have to find the promises, find out what those promises are, stand on those promises, and believe in those promises. And let me show you one. Matthew 3, 15 through 17. Lindell, you got that one? 15 through 17. Okay. But Jesus answered and said to him, 
per, permit it now, uh, permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When, Je uh, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my son, my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Okay. Now notice what happened when a person got baptized, when they came to God. One, the heavens were open. A divine voice said to him, you are my son. We're talking about family, child, adoption. And with you, I am well pleased. And then the Holy Spirit came upon him. So we see an endowment with power. We see the adoption as a child. And we see the Father saying to us, I'm well pleased with you. And I don't know about you guys, but I never had a father that said that to me. Mm, nope. so the first time I read this, and I thought, you know what? That's the first time I ever heard of my father saying to me, I'm well pleased with you. Was that Matthew what? 3, 15 through 17. Okay. So by finding the promises in the Bible and to stand on those, we find out what God has given us. What are these divine promises? What are these blessings he's given us? And unless a believer sees this and goes, wait a second, that's for me. That's why Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead, was filled with the power of God. And then he fills us with the same power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so there's this well-pleasing, and this is power that is given to us. We're endued with power. And there's a, it says the heavens were open. So there's a spiritual insight we get to have when we come to Jesus. So either one, we tap into that spiritual insight of heaven, or we don't. Let me give you one more scripture to Matthew 16, 12 through 20. Matthew 16, 12 through 20. Now let me read this to you, <clears throat> or unless somebody wants to read it. No, go ahead. Or I can split it. Okay, I'll read a couple. <clears throat> then they understood... 1612, that he, not, he did not tell them, be aware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The doctrine means the teachings, simply just means teaching, of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Watch out for those teachers. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I the son of man am. So they said, some say John, the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say I am? Then Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Okay, go ahead, Lindell. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth, you will bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Okay, now notice the context. We're talking about Pharisees, Sadducees, and their teaching. Now note, he said, who do you say I am? Verse 17. He said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Revealed what? That you are the Son of God. You are the Christ. And he said, on this truth that I am the Son of God. 
on this rock, Peter, verse 18, on this truth, on this rock, this truth that you just said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, in verse 19, and I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven or the understanding of what heaven's about. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. What he is saying is, wherever you preach that I am the Christ, people will be loosed from their sins. Or if they reject that I am the Christ, they'll be bound in their sins. The context here is all about who Jesus Christ is. Now, <clears throat> let me break down a Pharisee and the Sadducee teaching. Books came out about 30 years ago on how to bind and loosen, how to bind Satan, how to rebuke the devil. Yeah. You can't bind the devil. This verse has nothing to do with spiritual warfare. This verse has only to do with preaching of the gospel, that he is the Christ, the living God. So false teachers have created books by saying you can bind Satan, you can rebuke him, you can do spiritual warfare because you now have the keys and you can bind him. Well, you can scream and holler and bind all day long and nothing is going to change. And yes, I, tell, I tell the story that I had a group of people one time, we did a prayer walk and these ladies came in and said, we want to walk around the city and bind the spirit of adultery. Was that in Grants Pass? Uh, no, that was in Chehalis, <laughs> Washington. But I think it's everywhere. <laughs> it, it's everywhere. So I, I let it go for a good hour and a half and let it do it. And so when we got done, I stopped everybody and I said, okay, now listen. Because you guys took such good authority and you bound the spirits of adultery, there will not be another case of adultery in our town, in the city. There'll be no more. And everybody looked at me and said, well, wait a second. How can you say that? And I said, well, because you guys just bound all the spirits. You guys took authority over all of them. Well, Tim, you can't really say that. And I said, well, wait a second. Either it's true or it's not true. So we had a Bible study right there on the street corner. And I read them this verse. And they all went, wow, I never knew that. And one lady said, yeah, but you didn't read the book, Pastor Tim. If you had read the book, you'd really know the truth. And I said, the problem is I already know the truth. And I'm set free. And I've got power to walk in this every single day. So it was interesting that when we got done, uh, I went back to the church, everybody got in their cars. And I had about 10 people came up to me and they said, you know what? That changed my life tonight. I will never be the same. Because every time they tried to bind and do spiritual warfare, things never changed. So they thought God did not love them. They thought God was against them. Or they didn't have power. That they were missing something. It was a false teaching. And nobody corrected them. So after they were corrected, uh, they understood that. They never did that anymore. Well, two people decided to stay in the book. And I met them six months later, and their life went into chaos. But <laughs> we won't talk about that. So that leads us into who wrote the book of Romans. Well, we know it was the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> and let's look at Acts chapter 7. Verses 58 through 83. So who was Paul? Acts chapter 7, verse 58 to 83. So who would like to read half that? 58 to 83. Yep. Two, eight, three. Acts. Acts, Acts. Boy, I used to... I'm so used to my app. I can just like tap, tap, 
and I got it. I know what you mean. Yeah. I always go Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Oh, there you are. There you are, John. Okay. Acts. Let me start on part of it. Yeah, it, since you're there. Okay. Uh, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. This is Stephen. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, now notice, we're talking about Saul here. The first time he came on the scene, he keep on going. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Okay, so here is Saul, a young man. Seeing people stoned to death, putting people in prison, and he had great passion for the tradition of his fathers. So we see that he was uh, a guy skilled in the law and understanding of the law. Now let's look at his conversion in Acts chapter 22, verse 28. Okay, I messed up. So that was chapter Eight. Yeah, that was se well seven. Yeah, it started out seven fifty eight, and, and then, then it was eight, eight three. One eight through three. three. One through three. Okay, and then where are we going now? Uh, Acts twenty two twenty eight. Twenty two twenty eight. I can't believe how good I'm doing on this medication. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Okay, 22, 28. Here I am bragging, and then I can't find it. 29, 28. I'm ready. 22, 28. The commander answered with a large sum. I obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, but I was born a citizen. Citizen. Okay. C citizen. So we know that not only was Paul a Pharisee, but we know that Paul was also a citizen of Rome. He didn't have to buy his citizenship. He was born a citizen. He was born a citizen of Rome. To Rome. Yeah. Born in Rome, which made him a Roman. Yep. Jew. So not only that, so Paul's Jewish heritage meant more to him than his Roman citizenship. Let's look at Philippians 3 5. So I'll I'll jot over Philippians 3 5. It says Well, we'll start with uh four. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he have confidence in the flesh, I more so. This is Paul speaking. Uh, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost to Christ. So 
So here is Paul, probably in the top 5% of those men who were Pharisees, who knew the law, and that had zeal. So he was up there. He was no slacker. And how do we know that he was no slacker? Well, if we were to look at Acts 22.3 and Acts 5, 3 and 4 tells us more. So I'm going to go back to Acts 22.3. Well, let me go back. Okay. Okay. Dale, you got Acts 22.3? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of the Father's laws, and was zealous toward God as you are today. Okay, so he sat at the feet of the number one teacher of the time. He was one of the top guys being taught. So, and we, we, we know a lot about Gamaliel in our historical books. I'm not going to go there because we don't need to really study him. Okay, Acts 5.34 says this. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in respect by all the people, and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. So here we see him running the show. So Paul's teacher was running the show at that time. Having his apostles put out. So they could discuss those matters. So Paul's spiritual history gave him power. It gave him authority to teach and to command all those who followed Jesus. And how to live up to the revelation that God gave to Paul. So what kind of things do we know? Well, I'm going to give you three different scriptures and books. So I'm going to have you write these down. So uh, Lindell, you got 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 7. Uh, Wendy, you got 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 6. And I'll take Galatians 1, 11, and 2, 1 through 10. What were you taking, Galatians? Yeah, I'll take Galatians 1, 11, and Galatians 2, 1 through 10. 2, 1 through 10. Okay, let's see. Get over here. First Timothy 1, 3 through 7. Yep. Okay. As I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Now, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, have, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. Teach no other doctrine, no other way except what I have taught you. So he told Timothy, I have discipled you, Timothy. I taught you, Timothy. And make sure nobody else teaches anything else except what I laid down of how Jesus taught me. So there's a word in there. It's word sincere. And that word sincere comes from the word uh, without wax. And you, you would know that word if you lived in that biblical time. Because what took place, they would make pottery, it's like bowls. And when they baked those bowls, if they got a crack in that bowl, 
they would take that wax and they would put wax in that crack and cover it up. Then they would sell that bowl. Well, what would happen is over a period of time, you put stuff in that bowl and it would crack and spill everything. So what they had is they had tables. They had two different tables. They had one table that said sincere and one table that didn't. So they were selling bowls and pottery without wax. No cracks in them. They're not trying to cover up their cracks. And the other table was flawed pottery. So when we talk about being sincere, what we're saying to people is, I don't cover my cracks with, with wax. Okay, you guys hear what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm a crack pot. <laughs> That's where you get it from, see it? That's exactly where that came from. Yeah, that's the crackpot. So my point <laughs> is, it's better to show everybody your cracks, your flaws, and let people know that Jesus has healed those flaws and where you're broken at. I, so I, it's okay I, to not be okay. What's that? It's okay to not be okay. Exactly. I, I, have, I have no problem with people knowing my history, my background, when I was an ex-heathen. No, I, well, when I was a heathen, that became next heathen. Uh, so I have no problem letting people know. You know, I smoked pot, drank, partied around, did everything, you know, played sports. I, I did it all. Uh, except going to jail because I didn't get caught. Well, that's I good. It was a jail. Well, <laughs> it could have been a complication there. Yep. yep. <laughs> so, so my point is, when it comes to the forgiveness of Jesus, it's all about him touching us and healing us. So it's easier to live with your cracks than it is to try to cover them up with wax. Well, yeah, because eventually it you leak. That's right. So you to be apart. transparent with people, I think for me is more of a testimony than showing how perfect you are because there's nobody perfect but Jesus. Exactly. Okay, who's got the... Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 6. I do. Okay. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body, I do not know, or whether out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which is not lawful for man to utter of such a one. I will boast yet of myself. I will not boast except for in my infirmities for though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool for I will speak the truth, but I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. Okay, so Paul was caught up and taken to where? The third. Paradise. Yeah, paradise, the third heaven. And he didn't know if he was in the body or out of the body, but he was raptured up. And he saw and heard unspeakable things that man is not allowed to utter. He cannot talk about the revelation that he saw, only what God told him to preach. Wow. That's kind of stinky. <laughs> yeah. But imagine God calling you and said, okay, here's what I'm going to show you. Now you can, you can speak on this, but you can't speak on this. Yeah. Okay. So we know that he was raptured up. We know he had a divine appointment with God. Okay. Now I'm going to read Galatians 1, 11 and 12. Paul says, I make known to you, brethren, 
that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. So the good news is not according to man. Four, verse 12, I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the gospel and all the teachings we have from Paul came through Jesus Christ. None of it was made up by Paul. So many people think that Paul is teaching things out of his experience, but it was not his experience. It was a divine appointment with Jesus, and Jesus said, here's what I want you to preach. So Paul is explaining to us what Jesus is saying and how it works out. Okay, chapter 2, <clears throat> verses 1 through 10, chapter 2. <clears throat> verse 1 then after 14 years <coughs> I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas <coughs> and also took Titus with me and I went up by revelation and communicated to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. You need another cup of lemon. Yeah, you know what? I got lemon juice in here. Good. I think that's what's doing it. I can feel a little allergies in my throat. It's going to get better. There you go. Go. Nope. Which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who are of reputation, lest by any means I might run or have to run in vain. Yet, verse 3, not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. To whom we did not yield submission, even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Paul was not going to change for anybody or anything, verse 6, but from those who seemed to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seemed to be something added nothing to me. I love that part because there were days when as a, a young pastor, just learning about the Bible coming out of the world, I got around certain men who were leaders. And as I got around them, I thought, well, I can really respect this guy. Well, as time went on, I found less and less respect for leaders of the church and started to study the Bible myself. And I realized that some of those teachings were just, false, terrible teachings. And a lot of these men were just lukewarm. And I'm going to stop right there. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so you said something. Go back. You said God doesn't something. like give... God shows no personal favoritism to okay, no man. Does... Okay, God doesn't show favoritism, favoritism. to no man. It's in verse 6. And he said, for those who seem to be something, added nothing to me. So all those leaders added nothing to Paul, because he already had it from Jesus. Would, would you say that that means that we're all equal? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. It's all about who, it's all about who reads the Bible and studies it and pulls out the promises out of the Bible. So that's why I don't read paperback books. When, when someone writes a new paperback book, I just go. Because most of them are junk. You'll read my book, though, right? What book is that? <laughs> the, the book of my life. <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay, my verse 7. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, 
For he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And it goes on to, to give the right hand of fellowship. So Paul was called the priest to the uncircumcised, the Gentiles. But he was a Jew skilled in the law. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So. From these passages, we can glean some insight about why Jesus handpicked Saul. He, he picked Saul because, one, he had tenacious gumption. He was skilled in the word. And he was not afraid to fight a fight. So let's look at Acts chapter 9, 15 and 16. So, Lindell, why don't you take Acts 15, 9, 15 and 16. And, Wendy, you got Luke 22, 31. Luke 22, 31 and 32. You confused me. Acts 9. 15, verse 15 and 16. Oh, Acts okay. chapter 9. I got the 15 wrong. Yeah. Okay, 15 and 16. Yep. Um, but the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Okay, so now we know Paul is going to be a vessel, and he's going to preach before Gentiles, kings, and all the children of Israel. And suffer. And suffer. So, what I want to show you guys is underline this verse 16. You must suffer for my name's sake. When we get to chapter 4 and 5 and 6, I will show you how important it is to bear up under suffering. Because he who suffers and knows how to have the power of God fill a dead body, because chapter 6 talks about, don't you know that you died? Water baptism, came up, resurrected. And once a person knows how they are dead, how not to yield their members, 613, that all suffering they go through, the power of God can resurrect a dead body. I'm dead. I'm a goner. Therefore, since I'm a dead person right now, I'm a walking dead person, I live by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Galatians 2.20. I tell people, you have to memorize Galatians 2.20, which we'll get there. Okay. Wendy, uh, uh, Luke 22, 31 to 32. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm grasping this correctly. You bet. Okay. So I get the whole suffering for Jesus' sake. And then after that, you said something all, all people. Okay. So when we're baptized in water, like the, the dead man, you know, goes down in the water and then you're new through... Through Jesus. Chapter, yeah, chapter 6, yeah. You're born again. Yep. Okay, so... I'm sorry, I'm a little slow right now. Well, that's okay. I went, I, I went way ahead. Because uh, we'll hit that really heavy when we get those chapters. But what I'm saying is that suffering is part of God's plan. Suffering, Absolutely. Suffering will show you how much you can bear. And suffering will show you how much God is working in your life. Because when you go through suffering and you get through it and you are resurrected and you have power, power to sustain yourself through suffering, you'll look at yourself and you'll go, wow, God is alive in me. God is empowering me. Okay, so um, all suffering is part of God's plan. 
when you get through the suffering, you see how God worked in you. Yes. Yep. Yep. See. Okay. And how he empowers you. God. You get to see his mighty work empowering you. We read that in 2 Peter 1, 2 through 4. So the first 2 Peter, and we started opening up the soul Bible study of who Paul was. We're talking about that mighty power of God working in us and through his mighty promises. So I tell now, people this. I don't care for the suffering so much, but yeah. I get it. Like, I get it. You know, I mean, you know, I've suffered and I've gone through and I've, I'm now I'm here. And so I can see how he's worked in my life and like where I'm at now and how because of the sufferings that I suffered, now I can actually go and help other people who may have suffered through the same thing that I've suffered through and share Jesus as the one who helped me get through it. Like some people will be like, oh, well, I'll just have a drink, uh, alcohol, right? Because I'm mm -hmm. sad, depressed, whatever, stressed. But I, but I can say, hey, I know because I used to be an alcoholic. And now instead of grabbing for a drink, I grab for the Bible and I grab for Jesus. So that's what that's saying. Yes. And saying that, but it's also saying this, that suffering conforms us into the image of Christ. So when we go through a suffering, we are being conformed. We're being molded to be like Jesus. We're being changed from glory to glory into Jesus. We're partaking of his divine power in us, and it conforms us into like be like him. And how can Stephen say, or well, they're stoning him, hold the sin not against them? I would say, hell no, man. Rain down Bring down Simon and Gomorrah fire in these people's heads. You know what I'm saying? So, so you're like Peter. Yeah. <laughs> you want to you know? cut somebody's ear off. Yeah. Okay. Or so <laughs> suffering conforms us, molds us to be more like Jesus. Yep. So when the suffering comes, instead of being like a victim, you can be victorious knowing that this is, making you into a better person. Yep. Because we're Absolutely. supposed to rejoice in our suffering. I know that. You, but you that's so hard. You don't rebuke the devil. You don't right. rebuke the devil. You don't bind the devil. Because it's powerless. <laughs> right. You allow the power of the spirit to conform you. Because he will deliver you. He'll heal you. He'll transform you. He'll do whatever he needs to do to get you ready to face him face to face. And when the day you die is the day he said, okay, I'm done with you. Come on up. Come on up. Come on I up, babe. <laughs> you know? I'm ready. I'm ready to yeah. go. Okay. Yeah. I said that 10 okay. years ago. And yeah. my wife said to me, you're honey, you're still a crack pot. <laughs> <laughs> I said, thanks, son. That's what I need to hear. Tell her it takes one and no one, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. She's, heard okay. this, she's heard this a hundred times, so she knows it well. So for her, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So okay. I'm in Luke 22, 31. This is where Jesus predicts Peter's denial. Yep. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. And verse 32. Okay. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fall. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Okay. Okay. So that word sift, is that the word you, you talked about? Sifting the wheat. Sift you as wheat. Yep. That word in Greek you to read Thayer's lexicon or anything in the Greek, that means it's an agitation, a verse to overthrow. What it means is to knead bread. It's a, it's a thing of taking bread and you knead it and it falls through your fingers. Sift and you're just, you know, you're grinding that sucker and it, it squishes through your fingers. You're, that dough, you're just squeezing the hell out of it, right? 
And so Jesus said, hey, Satan's going to try to squeeze you through his fingers. But don't worry, man, I prayed for you. And you may go through some times, but don't worry about it. I want you to encourage your brothers when you come back. Pretty powerful, huh? Amen. So Jesus forewarns us by telling us, you know, you're going to deal with some spiritual suffering, some warfare, but don't worry about it, man. Hang into the promises. And as I restore you, as I restore you, tell your brothers about it. So a lot of times we try to escape that sifting. We want to run from being sifted. <laughs> Heck to the yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> I don't like to be sifted. I don't like to be squished like a grape to make wine. I do not like to be squished like a olive and make oil, but I get it. You know, you, you can't get a diamond unless you crush some coal. So the crushing, basically, he's saying the crushing is kind of like perfecting us in a way. Yeah, yeah. Right. So here's here's the dichotomy here. Satan wants to destroy our faith. That's his number one goal, to make us unproductive in our faith, in our service. So all the hard times that Paul experienced, he did not link his self-worth to it. He did not use his self-worth as a measurement to his closeness to Jesus. Or his attainment of what I call clergy stair climbing. Right? He allowed the suffering and said, I'm being more like Christ the more I suffer. And Satan never disrupted his faith. Never once was he disrupted. And that's... Jesus. Huh? But you're talking about Jesus. No, Paul. He has stopped. Oh, 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 oh. This, okay, now wait a second. This word, this is what I read. It's Jesus predicts Peter's Peter. denial. Yes. yes. And yes. Peter yes. did deny him. When, he did. Yeah. And like, but Peter came back, right? Well, sure. Yeah. Well, my point is the word sifting. Okay. Is there. And Paul, in our other verse, said, I'm like Peter. He, he went to the Jews and I'm going to the Gentiles. Gotcha. And I'm gonna and Jesus said, I'm gonna show you how much you're gonna suffer, Paul. So Peter got sifted, Paul got sifted. One got sifted by the Jews, one by Gentiles and, and Jews, both. So yeah. both of them went through a sifting. Both of them suffered. Both of them got their derrieres kicked up around their neck. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yes, sir. And the Bible tells us, don't think it's strange when you go through these types of tribulations. Don't think it's strange or uncommon. So uh, I realized in my life that when I went through stuff, I, I just figured, okay, here it goes. And let me tell you something, guys. I, I don't know too many people who have been persecuted. I mean, when I first got saved, I was at a park with somebody, with my guys from high school, guys I played football with and smoke pot and drank. We're down at Reed College. Down at Reed College. And I, I was probably, I don't know, three months into the war. Uh, it was in the summer. And uh, went to church, came back. These guys were at football field at Reed College, soccer field, I mean. I went down to say hi because that was our Sunday flag football and drink beer and smoke pot down there. And I, I came back and they said, so Tim, you're at church again, Billy? Billy Graham, you in church again? And this one guy looked at me and he goes, uh, hey, Billy, come here, Billy. And he walked to me and he goes, bam, and he slapped me in the face. And he goes, if you're a Christian, you're supposed to turn the other cheek. And that morning, the sermon was on uh, Samson killing a thousand Philistines with the jawbone <laughs> of an ass. So you slugged him. Well, yeah, what happened was he... I, I, he shocked me and I went, I didn't know what to do. I just stared at him because am I not supposed to turn the cheek? Or am I supposed to do it? And so he raised his hand to slap me again. And as I stood there, like, uh, the hand came up and I, he went to slap me and I just moved it just enough to went by me. 
<clears throat> and I said, you Philistine. <laughs> <laughs> and I he probably didn't know what that <clears throat> I came up with an uppercut in the jaw knocked him on his butt jumped on his chest put my knees on his arms and poked him in the chest like this so I'm sitting on top of him telling him about Jesus and I said you know who's this, guy? who's this guy by the name of Samson and he took a bone of an ass and he stabbed people with his job of an ass. That's what you are. You're an ass. And I just hit him on the chest because he was dazed. You know, I hit him in the jaw and he fell down. So he was still kind of, you know, I'm sure his head was going, you know, and I'm yelling at him. So I'm sitting on his chest telling him about Jesus. And you need Jesus. And you need and I'm on his chest, you know, telling him about this stuff. And the other guys came and pulled me off him. And they said, Tim, 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 man, he was just teasing you. Well, so I know he's teasing me, but he slapped me. And I'm just telling you what the Bible says. <laughs> they went, what? So that next week I went to the youth pastor at the church and I said, hey man, I got a chance to witness to this guy. And I told him the story, you know, slapped me and I gave an undercut and jumped on his chest and I told him about Jesus. They said, Tim, that's not how you tell people about Jesus. You don't punch <laughs> them and sit on their chest. And I said, well, that's what Samson did. I'm going to I'm gonna have to try that one. Yeah. And, and he said, well, no, do you know who? I said, no, I never read that in the Bible. All I know is what happened to me when I got born again. I'm about halfway through Matthew only. <laughs> he goes, you've only read like 10 chapters of the, of the Bible. That's about all I know so far. Yeah. <coughs> well, with that being said, it is 11 p.m. here, and I usually wake up at 5, so I've got to go. Um, but if you guys want to continue, I can watch the YouTube and finish no. out. No, we but got one I, hour and we're done. What's that? One hour and we are done. Okay. Well, it's been yeah. an hour. Yeah. Yep. So, okay. I'm going to close in prayer. Okay. Father God, I thank you for these guys being here with the study with me. And I would ask, Father, that as they go through their sufferings and their time and their joyful times and just all those times, you show them how much you're working in their life so they'll have joy and peace that passes understanding. Show them the greatness, Lord, of what that is down the road. Ask us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.